What we wanted to do is explore the sort of resonances that come up and happen for different sorts of institutions, institutions of different sizes that have, say, different capacities at um, an individual staffing level as well, and to look at how you might be able to move something from an idea to actually getting it done, who might be involved with that, what are some of the complexities with different sorts of projects. So we're going to do this from three museums. So we've got Rob Lansfield, who is the Museum Information Services and Registrar of Collections for the Davison Art Centre at Wesleyan University. <laughs> and Rob is in an institution. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Rob's Come in an institution down. with 2.5 staff. So we thought he represented the small end of the sector pretty well. Um, so next we have Dylan. So Dylan is here um, as manager of web and social media initiatives at the Walters Art Museum. Dylan has, there's a staff around 150 or so, um, but he himself is in a staff of one. The department is The one. department is a staff of one. <laughs> and then we have Morgan Holzer and her actual title is project manager at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So they have a much bigger staff. So we think about 1800 and she's actually got 55 in her team. So 58. 50, 58 in I her found team. out last night. <laughs> <laughs> Since so, I made my slides. <laughs> this is why we thought, we thought this would be an interesting way of just working out. So although we are going to be looking at some projects, this is less about the project itself but more about how those things actually happen. We're going to have fairly short uh, talks initially, so these guys will be aiming for about 10 to 15 minutes worth of um, presentation, but then we actually would really like this to be quite a nice discussion because I'm sure all of you are from institutions of various sizes and will have different complexities as to who you have to answer to and those sorts of things, so we thought it might be nice to have that discussion. I'm going to be following the Twitter. I should also introduce myself. My name's Suze Cairns. I'm actually a PhD student from Newcastle, Australia. Um, our hashtag for this session is MCN2012PROP for proposal, so P-R-O-P. I'm going to be following the Twitter if you want to get questions up whilst you're going or comments that we can respond to, but otherwise we're going to open the floor once we have a chat. So Rob's going to kick it off because there's a little institution we thought it might be nice yeah. to move up through. Good. And uh, as Sue's mentioned, this will mostly be oriented more towards the um, sort of social institutional aspects of process. Um, you'll see not a single system diagram or anything in here, although it is in a sense about a system, it's actually not. Um, thanks to Susan Morgan, by the way, for inviting me to, to join this. So first, a snapshot of institutional setting. Uh, I work at the Davison Art Center, or DAC, at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And we hold a collection of about 24,000 works of art. Uh, these are mostly original prints, photographs, and other works on paper. Our chief mission with that collection is to support teaching, learning, and other educational use of what we hold. Uh, we serve that mission by welcoming lots of class and individual student vi viewings of objects. Uh, as well as presenting three or four public exhibitions per year in our gallery space. Total staffing, as Sue's mentioned, uh, for our entire museum operation is an extremely minimal 2.5 uh, FTEs, full-time equivalents. The curator, who is also our de facto director and exists in org chart land as a department chair at Wesleyan, uh, me as manager of museum information services and registrar of collections, and our preparator installer, who is half time with us, doing a combination of collections work and exhibition related work, and half time with a, another gallery on campus that has no collection. So, uh, these contextual factors lead to, among other things, what you see up there, uh, we collaborate with and rely on other university departments for some key underpinnings of what we do uh, that are not. Um, specialized in museum ways. These include HVAC and most other facilities work, uh, network infrastructure, email, which is like the air we breathe. If it goes down, it's not my problem to fix it, uh, and so on. A lot of my work actually consists of building good working relationships with people who not only don't report to me, uh, but whose reporting chains are almost in completely different worlds of the university, um, only converging so high that it's functionally irrelevant to the day-to-day. 
Uh, our tiny staff juggles all museum-specific operations as well as general administration. And while we hire student workers for certain things, uh, it's mostly just us three staff people there. This, of course, as you can guess, uh, makes life a constant state of what is often kind of a slow motion triage among things that must be done now, such as accommodating a class viewing uh, when the students are showing up, the prints do definitely come out of the vault on time, dealing with immediate facilities issues and just things that simply can't be pushed back. Uh, those that absolutely need doing but can be deferred if necessary, and a good example here is collections metadata work, um, totally essential, but typically end of day is not significant for that. Um, and those that sadly slip into a prolonged state of suspended animation, uh, despite promising clear value to mission, they never float to the top um, in this day-to-day -day assessment. And after a while, anything in that last part simply needs to be killed off clean or radically rethought for some sort of pivot that might enable it to come back to life in a changed context. The project I'll touch on today is in the second category, uh, that of necessary things that may take longer than desired, but do actually get done. Um, I'll zip through it via some questions Sue's uh, proposed. So uh, the project focused on a new collection management system. Uh, the scope of the project basically consisted of selecting, acquiring, and configuring the system, migrating our data into it, proceeding as quickly as possible to launch a first iteration of collection search online, uh, backed by a data subset from the new backend system. The backdrop to all this was my long-standing plan and the long-standing, just plain evident need uh, to move our collections information into a system for which expertise is available uh, out in the world beyond the DAC. Since 2000, that information had lived in an in-house system uh, on a physical server on our premises and it served our needs well with interfaces and logic tailored for local users, um, the sorts of one-off bespoke stuff you can really only do if you build. Um, and zero unplanned downtime during 11 years of actual service, but despite having self-describing function names and lots of commenting and all those good things, uh, it always had an extremely fragile dependency on a single point of medium-term perspective failure. That would be me. Uh, it's one in-house developer. Um, built using FileMaker as a rapid application development environment and client-server software for it to run on, it was always conceived as an interim bridge to a time when we could afford to move to a system that did not have that fragility. So uh, in the mid-90s, before I decided to develop that interim solution as the one practical way to both meet functional needs and uh, live within cost constraints, the strongest candidate commercial system for us was an, an earlier version, far earlier version, uh, of the one that we did eventually move to in 2009. So in a sense, through assessing that system and other candidates ever since, uh, my involvement started uh, about a dozen years before this specific process as a concrete set of steps really did. Uh, luckily for me, I tend to take the long view, so it drove me crazy, but didn't make me run away. Uh, roles that would be more widely distributed elsewhere uh, tend to converge in my position uh, in our tiny shop. Um, I'm the one museum technology person there and the one art collection manager, which makes some of my roles in this context uh, pretty obvious. Determining functional needs, assessing product fit with those needs, proposing best fit candidate software, uh, configuring and administering the system once we acquired it, doing data conversion, and so on. But equally necessary outside that more technically focused stream, uh, was the role of overcoming funding constraints within our nested institutional context as tiny museum within small university. And accomplishing that came down to a mix of communication with uh, Wesleyan colleagues who, for the most part, were quite unfamiliar with museum operations um, and a serendipitous opportunity that arose out in space external to us. I knew that while it had made sense for us to, to develop the back office system in-house in the late 90s, that it would have been a giant strategic mistake to wed our tiny shop to additional in-house solutions for uh, other core functions. There would have been no sense in allocating time to build some sort of similar, rapidly developed one-off thing uh, to sort of public-facing collection search. Um, compounding the fragility of that sort of approach itself in our context where we 
don't and realistically will never have dedicated developer time, even as timeshare of somebody on staff. It's always been a matter of carving things out on the fly. Um, moving to that kind of resource would have tended to lock in our interim back office solution as the data source for web delivery. And in that way to solidify both one-offs as seemingly long-term solutions, uh, despite the fact that we have always known that that would be unsustainable in the long run. Um, so implementing web search in any kind of expedient way with our uh, current interim in-house system uh, would have crippled any future case we ever could have made for spending intelligently to do it right. So a sustainable model for long-term management of collection information and for public search gave us two mission-driven reasons with which we could advocate for funding for the adoption of an externally developed and supported collection system. My own first among equals of these two reasons had always been our less widely visible need to remove our core operational dependency on me as the one person who could best keep our in-house system humming away. That's the hit by a bus scenario and the sleeping at night scenario, so many others. Uh, a close second among equals in my mind was our need to provide public web search of collections metadata. As it turned out, opportunity arose elsewhere at Wesleyan a couple of years ago where evolving contexts offered us some fresh traction for the web search reason. And while I knew that would best be implemented as part of a larger systematic change, it was initially unclear how best to help the people who were actually controlling budgets understand this. Um, conversations with the DAC curator led us to rethink together how we might best present that case. And where we settled was rather than talking first about the back office CMS, although probably everybody in this room would understand that that's ultimately more fundamental to collection stewardship, uh, we foregrounded web search and showed that the sustainable way to implement that would be as part of a larger system changeover that would have crucial upside behind the scenes as well. So uh, from our actual sort of heart of hearts, how we think about it list like this, it underwent a radical change to a list that looks like this. And if I toggle back and forth, you'll see that of course they are the same. We've just flipped number one and number two, which is <laughs> trivial, right? But it made a huge difference. Um, without flipping that switch and how we explained its benefits to funding stakeholders so that the first thing they heard was web search. Um, it's quite likely that, that the project would have died again on the vine and slipped back into that sort of catatonia of necessary but unfunded. There were three main classes of stakeholders for this, uh, users, funders, and technical partners. Uh, users included DAC colleagues and the many students and faculty who used the collection. Uh, through working in person with thousands of on-premises users, on premises users over the years, uh, it was pretty clear to me what sorts of functionality they most often wanted for discovery of physical holdings, which was clearly our defining focus for early stage work on this. Uh, funders were keepers of univers university budgets external to the DAC. Uh, making the case to them for this proposed approach relied on communicating the reasons for that path in a way that was true and well-grounded and framed to clarify how its outcomes would connect most meaningfully with their aims and priorities. And lastly, technical partners started with the vendor of the system known to offer the best fit with our needs and soon grew to include colleagues in Wesleyan's Information Technology Services Department. Key early partners were ITS leaders who supported the proposal and collaborated on thinking through all possible cost savings in system architecture. Uh, as planning and implementation progressed, operations staff in the ITS data center became indispensable partners in actually creating the virtual machines on which our server instances now happily run out from under our roof, um, but connected by a nice fast campus backbone. While users and funders were central to the project's success, the team as such was <clears throat> uh, far smaller. It was, again, basically me doing the planning and implementation, which is natural in our tiny world uh, because creation and implementation of museum information strategy is vested in that one uh, position. But as would any at least halfway sensible person in that position, um, I happily collaborate with the curator and other university staff, and that's actually the way that things get done there. Um, so while in a strict sense, the team might look like one person, it was actually one person who benefited from invaluable partnerships uh, inside and outside the museum operation as such. 
The project's total cash budget was about 17,000 in upfront expense, plus a projected 6,000 in average annual costs. Uh, most of that goes to software maintenance and support. A little bit of it is equipment replacement cycles, but since on the server end, we're all running on VMs, um, that is non-broken out cost that other university folks absorb as part of their cost of doing business and is essentially free for us in a budgetary sense. So um, as a defined process after the long years of conceptual planning I alluded to earlier, the core of the project began with concrete proposals in August 2008, funding in May 2009, software acquisition in August 2009, followed by configuration, some core data conversion, initial report formatting of the ones we simply had to have ready to go at go live. Um, launch for all DAC staff, doesn't all DAC staff sound dramatic, but it actually means my two colleagues, <laughs> um, in August 2010 uh, to ease the way for them because I really do like them and didn't want to make this a point of pain any more than it had to be. Um, both systems stayed up and live in parallel operation for a few months uh, with very tightly controlled write access to the old system, but in fact still a little tiny bit of write access for things that just would help them stay sane uh, dealing with the transition. Um, and then some final bits of mopping up on my part and lockdown of the old system as a read-only reference in January 2011, at which point we were <coughs> firmly in the new system. Uh, all business operations were running in there. Uh, or all operations that can support for running there. Uh, but the old system is actually still live because it turns out that there are certain kinds of extremely short turnaround on the fly access where the curator is well accustomed to jumping into it, looking something up, and for the most part those tend to be via um, access points that do not change very fast. Um, so I'm hoping to kill it in January, but we'll see. Um, some configuration of the new system and work on the metadata it holds is going to be ongoing, of course. I mean, these things never really end. The focus of that work this year has been on enabling public web search, which soft launched this August in a very early iteration with descriptive metadata and no images um, as a minimum viable product with close to zero degree design, but it's basically just a public alpha um, that enables holding discovery uh, and started doing so at the earliest possible time. And in that sense, it's live, it works, and it's iterating, and it's going to get better. All told, the project has been successful. Uh, true to its triage location, its day-to-day -day advancement often has to wait for unrelated fires with immediate deadlines. But with actual collection management switched over and public web search uh, soft launched and iterating, it's making good headway and has achieved those two major outcomes um, on somewhat slipped timelines in both cases they are live. Um, I just wish I could carve out more time to work on the inevitably long and growing punch lists of improvements I want to make to them. So looking back uh, to the key moment when we got traction for funding the cash costs of a vendor supported system, a takeaway here may be that when we have equally true ways of making the case for a project, it's common sense to choose the one that aligns most closely with the motivations and the aims of our prospective partners not necessarily the one that reflects our own internal priorities. Um, blindingly common sense, but it frankly hadn't occurred to us until we were cued to think that way by a funding opportunity that connected strongly to what had not been our first bullet point and became that. Uh, looking a bit further back to how the use of our previous interim system as an environment fine-tunable for data standardization enabled us to lay groundwork for migration into an out-of-house system when funding did eventually allow a related takeaway may be that when a direct move to the best long-term option isn't yet possible, there's often a lot we still can do with existing resources to prepare the way and make that move more efficient when a new context does enable it. So with that, over to Dylan. I will get out of the way here. And I think we're holding any questions until the end. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dylan Kinnett. Uh, I work at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, 
It's uh, I'm the medium uh, of the of the small, medium, large offerings you have here today. Um, uh, our institution has about uh, thirty-five thousand objects in its collection. It's uh, what you could categorize as an encyclopedic collection. Uh, it was acquired uh, primarily by uh, Henry and William Walters, who, uh, who are a pair of father and son industrialists. Uh, they liked to collect uh, ancient Renaissance, uh, lots of manuscripts. Uh, uh, so so it's, uh, it's that type of collection. Uh, we have about 150 people on the staff, and we get about 200,000 people uh, through the doors every year. Uh, what my role is at the museum uh, is, is essentially the, the web developer. Uh, I have to work closely with uh, almost every other department in the museum uh, to accomplish that job. Uh, my primary duties include uh, making websites, uh, doing social networking, uh, doing the analytics and some of the strategy work uh, behind those two things. Uh, and I consult, uh, hire for, or develop myself uh, for a number of kiosk uh, uh, functions and, and devices that we have uh, throughout the museum, uh, both for uh, exhibitions, major exhibitions, uh, focus shows, and occasionally just for uh, long-term use uh, in, a, in, in a, a gallery. Uh, so the proposal uh, that I'd like to talk about is, is one that I'm sure you've heard a lot about, uh, you may have worked with yourself, is uh, it seems simple, let's put the art on the internet. Uh, that would be good, right? Uh, our, our role as a museum is to show the art to people, and there sure are a lot of people on the internet, uh, so it, it, it seems like a good idea to do this. Um, and and uh, so I want to talk about the sort of workflows that are involved with that. Uh, uh, who do you have to work with? Uh, is part of that, but also how does the information travel? Uh, at the Walters, we're not, we're not enormous and we're not infinitely funded, so we have to be kind of smart and careful about uh, the, the amount of work that we do. Uh, we don't want to have to reinvent any wheels. Uh, so to the extent that we can, uh, we want our information to be as easily portable as it can be. Uh, so that we can get it to the internet uh, without uh, making it incre uh, incorrect or without having to recreate it. Uh, and so I have this diagram that comes from uh, my colleague Kate, who's sitting back there. She's the database administrator uh, at the Walters and, and uh, So this is how she would explain to you that data flow. Uh, and I have some, some other data flows that I'll show you uh, in a moment. But uh, this one is the data that describes uh, the art. Uh, it, it begins its life uh, in our TMS collections management database, uh, where the curators have uh, the read-write access that they need to have in order to adequately describe an object. Uh, and there are, there are lots of uh, bits of information that live in there uh, that do not uh, flow through this entire system. There are things in there that, that stay there exclusively. Uh, so this isn't about making a complete copy of the whole thing in every case. It's about taking the information that you need in a case uh, out of there uh, and putting it into a, another context uh, without recreating it. Um, uh, you'll see some red stars. Uh, these are parts of this process that are either in progress or uh, th that might be hypothetical at this point. So this is a model. It's a work in progress. It's not uh, entirely uh, complete or, or perfect yet. Uh, but it, I think it's the direction we're going. Um, so from TMS, it can get into our, we have a DAMS uh, that, that describes uh, things that are in TMS, but also other things. So it would include things like brochures or copies of signage or bits of video and things that are uh, not so directly related to the collection that they, that they belong in the TMS. Uh, they go in the DAMS. Uh, the, the green things are the, the outside world. The purple things are the inside the museum. Um, from the, from the TMS, we can also uh, query the information needed for the collections website, uh, which we hope to extend in the, in the relatively near future to include an API uh, so that other web users can, can get in on the process you see mapped here, uh, which would make it easier to port things to things like mobile applications or, or other websites or repositories. Uh, we would like very much to be able to say to uh, some website that wants to have lots of our art on it, uh, here it is, go get it, instead of, I'll make that for you, give me time. Because uh, uh, 
time and, and people power is, is a precious <coughs> commodity for us. So uh, if we can make them do it, then, uh, well, that's better for us. And it might be better for them, too, because they can, uh, we can expose data to them and they can pick out what they want. Uh, so we don't not always necessarily have to have that meeting where we sit down and we decide which are the collection highlights. It seems every time we have that meeting, the highlights are different. Uh, and that's because the context is different. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, we, can, we can let the context itself make that determination uh, if, it, you know, if that's appropriate. Or we could say, uh, here's how to query the set that we've decided that you need. Uh, so an API would make that useful. Um, Without the API, the, the website does a pretty good job of exposing the information. Uh, the, the database that sits behind it is flexible enough uh, that we can take the stuff that's been approved for web use and, and move it to other repositories. Um, I should mention that because of the nature of our collection, we don't worry uh, too much about copyright. Uh, we consider most of these digital assets to be uh, public domain materials. We give them a Creative Commons license. Uh, the documentation is also uh, similarly licensed, uh, which, which helps with that portability. Uh, there are a lot of talks about, uh, about that sort of copyright issue, that sort of uh, whether or not to make that move. Uh, at the Walters, our, our director has essentially mandated it, so uh, that does do a lot to make this uh, type of scenario a little easier, I think. Uh, so we don't have to worry so much about restrictions. That said, there are things that we do not expose to the web that we do keep uh, for ourselves. I, I think a lot of the conservation data is like that. There are things that we don't necessarily want uh, the entire world to, to have at where conservation is concerned. Um, but we do want to expose what we can. So we're working on, and I'll, I'll talk about that some more in a minute. Uh, this, is, this chart describes a lot of work. Uh, it took a long time to sort of figure out that this is the direction we want to go. Um, we have other information uh, at the museum. We have programs, uh, lots of them, uh, tours, lectures, classes. Uh, and, the, and the marketing and education sides of the house uh, are a little envious of the way that the collections data can travel uh, so dynamically. So uh, I'm working on a way to uh, augment our CMS in order to behave in a way that resembles what you saw in the previous slide. Um, so that when you're entering uh, the description of an event, uh, we're thinking ahead to the website, the press release, the brochure, the signage, our members magazine, uh, the needs of the media, and so on. Uh, the, the sort of rule of thumb is write it once. Uh, you have a lecture coming up next Thursday. Write it down one time. What's the title of the event? Uh, what time is it? Uh, if you write it down a second time, you might mess up and say, well, the, t the title can change, the, the time can change. And uh, when that has a, a direct impact on whether or not people show up for the event. Uh, so, so we want to minimize that. Again, we're sort of a medium-sized staff, so uh, writing it once is better than writing it three or four times. Uh, so it, you know, why, why should we make our educators write copy for all of these things when this copy uh, is basically describing the same thing every time? Uh, so the CMS's uh, entry form is, is, is growing a little bit to include um, bits of text that, that the user can input uh, that are useful in, in non-web contexts like uh, press releases and, and signage uh, so that we can just capture that information in a single go. Um, the, the workflow is uh, a, little, uh, a little strict. There's a triannual deadline. Uh, it's not a, not a commonly used word in the museum world. Uh, at that deadline, uh, you, you're sort of required uh, to enter all the information about all the events that you will be having in the next four months. Uh, the reason we do it this way is it gives us a really great head start on things like press releases and our, our other sort of outlets where they need the information early because they have to go to print. Uh, or the information needs to go into other systems and be manipulated before it, it's, it's ready for the final output. Uh, things like our magazine take a couple months to assemble every time. Uh, so we really want to get ahead of it. Uh, get the information, get it once, get it right, and then get it out. Um, that's the sort of strategy there. Um, I'll, I'll note that on the, on the far end here, sometimes uh, the information's coming from us, but not directly. Uh, you know, a journalist is free to uh, browse our web calendar and copy and use uh, information about events. And we do want to encourage that. That's the sort of viral uh, marketing model. Uh, so so uh, uh, that's just part of how the information travels uh, and a bit about how 
uh, we work with others to do it. Um, so I want to talk uh, again about our collections website. Uh, the proposal is let's put our information online, uh, but that evolves over time. Uh, this, was our, this was our first pass at it. Uh, and around uh, 2001, uh, we had, uh, a, we had a, a group of about 100 highlights of the collection that we put up on our website. Uh, very small JPEG images there uh, uh, compared to what, what would be sort of customary nowadays. Uh, they were at 72 DPI. We had about eight things we would tell you about them. Uh, uh, and and uh, and that was lovely. We were very proud of that. Uh, we did a copyright on it because it was such hard work to do that. We certainly wouldn't want anyone to take our hard work from us. Uh, that was a while ago. Things have changed. Hmm. Um, the images weren't big enough, so uh, one of the next steps was to make them bigger. Uh, this is a sort of um, the the website sort of redesigned itself, uh, and along the way, the the collections part of the. Uh, the website uh, had an opportunity to, to make an adjustment. Uh, so the, the images got bigger. We had this sort of flash gizmo that would let you zoom in on the thing. But again, not to copy that precious large image. Oh no, the flash uh, would prevent that from you. So, so you're still, the, the only uh, JPEG asset that you're getting is still sort of that old one. We've made it slightly larger at this point. And we doubled the number. Uh, well, we more than doubled the number of, of items uh, that we exposed uh, online. So uh, now we have a whopping uh, 250 here, uh, which, is, uh, which is much more in line with what you might want to see on a highlights tour uh, or whatever. So, so uh, we've got a few more of our rock stars in here. But it's the same amount of information. Um, the information has changed since 2001. You'll notice I keep using the same painting in each uh, stage. You'll notice uh, the description's a little longer now uh, than it was in the, in the previous version. It's been revised. Um, we, we now have a sort of model that, that catches up with that type of revision very quickly. Uh, there's a nightly batch script that looks for, did the curator change the title of this painting? If so, we'd like to get that online ASAP. Did the Kira write a new, better uh, description? Uh, we would like that as well. Did we discover that the date was wrong and did we correct it? Uh, so that's now done dynamically, but at this point, uh, that was a very manual process. Uh, this stuff was written in, in, in plain old uh, HTML, so uh, you have to go in and edit the code and so on. Uh, then at 2007, we had, I guess, the 2.0 version of the website. It's no longer manual. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, there, it sits uh, behind a database uh, that's a copy of our uh, TMS. Stuff. It's not a dynamic copy. There's not a, a, a good relationship uh, between the two. And now we've got a whopping 5,000 uh, works of art uh, on the site. Uh, the museum has been undergoing a pretty extensive digitization effort. I suppose the end, event, the end goal there is to have the entire collection uh, photographed and online. Uh, so, so that enabled this sort of 5,000 uh, mark to, for us to hit that, is that uh, that work had been ongoing uh, probably since uh, well before this was launched in order to have the, the 5,000 there. Um, we added a new feature called uh, Art of the Day, uh, which begins to sort of go in the direction, well, okay, it's, it's nice to have the, the stuff online, but people want to kind of do stuff with it. Uh, so this was our first uh, uh, interactive feature, I suppose you could say. Uh, it's, it's so out of 5,000 objects, which you're not going to get to see within the average three-minute uh, visit, uh, we grab one and we show it to you today. Come back tomorrow, I'll show you a different one. Uh, so today it might be uh, one thing, tomorrow it might be something completely different. To try to encourage repeat visits uh, and to grab uh, a, a sort of highlight from the collection. And these were uh, picked out carefully, manually. Um, uh, so you'd, you'd have to do that work to, uh, to say, okay, uh, three Thursdays from now, which work will be the art of the day? Uh, and that was very time consuming. Uh, but worthwhile uh, and, and actu actually kind of fun. You know, we have a Fabergé egg, that's good for Easter. Uh, you, can, you can have some sort of uh, fun thematic connections between whatever's going on uh, in, in, in the world or in time uh, and your collection, uh, which begins a nice uh, social media approach. 
um, you drop a RSS feed behind the object of the day, and then you can port that to Twitter, to Facebook, uh, with minimal effort. Uh, now your art of the day is a feature of your uh, web presence uh, wherever you go, and that part's automated, so you don't have to. Uh, once you've made the decision, what is the art of the day today, <coughs> you can you can sleep easy knowing that it's going to show up in front of a few thousand people in a couple of other online contexts. So uh, that was probably the my favorite feature of, of this version of the website. My least favorite feature was its search engine. Uh, and that, that's sort of an ongoing problem, uh, especially as the amount of information is growing. Uh, you you have to think carefully about how you handle a search engine. It's, it's a really critical and important part of, of a large online collection. And uh, it's hard to get it perfect. That's expensive development work. Uh, so you, you have to, um, or at least we have to, uh, sort of compromise between uh, what's good enough, what can we afford, how can we iterate on it until it's more perfect. Uh, so, um, so that's just sort of part of the, the issue there. This website was uh, written in ASP.NET uh, in, a, in, a, in a basically Microsoft only type of environment. Uh, this one, the newest one, uh, we kind of scuttled the code base for it. We moved to PHP in a MySQL environment. We did not, of course, scuttle the, the data. Uh, so, th so that stuff was all structured uh, more or less the, the way it had been, uh, although it was in a new environment. We did add and are continuing to add uh, extra data points. So now you can begin to explore conservation histories, uh, exhibition records. This is a nice whopper of an image there uh, that we allow you to download at relatively high resolution. Uh, there's no more copyright, so if you want to download and then use the image, we, we welcome you to do that. Uh, the, it's written in HTML5, so you can, you can zoom in, but that doesn't give you a flash barrier. Uh, we have a few more interactive features. You can tag things. You can, um, you can move around via the, the, the various terms that are also hyperlinked to groups of objects that share that term. Uh, so the artist name, the medium, things like that, uh, to make it a little more laterally flexible, uh, which we saw uh, does help with uh, engaging the visitor. The, uh, the timely spin goes up when you make those things happen. Um, uh, what am I missing? Oh, the the uh, the add to collection feature. You can you can make groups of objects and give them names. So you can have things that are blue, things that hurt, uh, uh, funny faces, babies. Uh, people are making unusual collections that uh, that other people enjoy. Um, it's especially useful for teachers and docents who can put together a collection of things that would be part of a tour later, uh, and then they can show that collection to others and discuss in advance of the tour. Um, curators have begun to use it to, to make a quick and easy way to show off uh, what's in an exhibition or what might be in an exhibition. Uh, and, and average users are, are having a lot of fun with it. So we've, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that one. Uh, the, the, there are share buttons. Uh, that's nice, too. Um, so then the next step, you've put your art online. What now? Uh, you know, the website that I just showed you, the latest version of our collections website, has a few built-in uh, functions that let you manipulate the stuff. You can download it, you can group it up, you can describe it. Um, but we wanted to kind of go beyond that, uh, to think about, uh, you know, well, what does it mean for us as an institution? What does this change for the way we do things now that we have all of this information publicly available and, and able to be manipulated? Uh, does the public know that it's there? What does the public want to do with it? Um, so we started to think about ways of, of sort of, of putting this to use so that we can get the, the, the sort, of, sort of answer to the so what question uh, or to provide value now that we have gone online with, with so many things. Um, one of the uh, names of the game for that sort of thing is a concept uh, we call creative constraint. Uh, I'm sure anyone in a small organization is, is familiar with constraints of time, uh, people power, uh, budget, and so on. Uh, it can be, it can be uh, tricky to, uh, to build on the effort uh, <coughs> to put uh, thousands of things online with a bigger effort. Uh, so we're, we're still busy putting things online. It's a more central effort. So a lot of the things uh, that we've done to utilize the online collection are small 
Uh, and some of them are fairly experimental uh, because we're not quite sure what people want to do with this stuff just yet. Uh, and we're, we're sort of in a sort of listening phase for that. Uh, we did uh, last summer uh, an exhibition that we crowdsourced the curation of. Uh, it was called Public Property. Uh, it was a, a small uh, and, and short project. Uh, we had, it was run primarily by uh, uh, people whose roles in the uh, museum are non-curatorial. Uh, the, the social media people, some educators uh, and the like, just to just sort of play with a a digital uh, curation model just to see what that might be like. Um, so we, we invited people to tag and collect lots of things. We looked for patterns. We had conversations with the visitors about which of those patterns were most compelling to them. Uh, and we built interactives that enabled them to make selections and choices uh, about uh, lots of information, uh, which was sort of the spirit of the thing. How do you deal with lots of information the educators like to begin to deal with uh, the 21st century learning skills. You know, they want to make those points uh, with the visitors. Um, but the show is also about the decisions that you make, not just about manipulating information, but uh, to be to be critical in a number of ways. So, uh, the various activities in the exhibition uh, were about dealing with uh, with images and so on in a, in, a, in a couple of different ways. Uh, if it's social or impulsive or analytical. Uh, to say that you know when you think about art, you think in various ways about art, and uh, you know how does that how does that work in your head? Um, this was a uh, what you, okay. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna speed up. <laughs> um, we're, we're subtle here. <laughs> uh, this is an application called Photocracy. It's going to show you thousands of images two at a time, and you tell it which one you like better. Uh, this is a, a, an activity called Stack the Vote. We're going to show you a bunch of paintings, and uh, you're going to put chips down to represent whether you like one a little or a lot, thereby building a bar graph. Uh, we had a hackathon, uh, speaking of ways that the museum works. To go with uh, to go with that exhibition, uh, uh, to to sort of suggest that um, you know, crowdsourcing curation isn't the only way to do this thing. It's popular right now, but there are things like citizen science. There are things like hackathons. There are things like Wikipedia. There are ways to deal with lots of information in an open and public way, uh, beyond uh, outsourcing a curator's job to the public, which uh, is not necessarily the best idea in the world. Um, and we learned a lot from that hackathon. Uh, a number of projects uh, have, have entered into active development with the museum. Uh, and my final slide is just a photo of the hackathon to show this is a new way to work. Uh, we brought uh, people from the public in with us and worked together with them. Uh, so thank you, thank you for all of your time. <laughs> So while Morgan's getting set up, um, I'll just thought I'd let you know when we do get to the question stage, we have these amazing little prizes for people that ask questions. Um, these are from Tatley, so we have some awesome um, sweet tattoos to give to people so you can look really cool after our session. Um, and you can either come up and get them now or at the time, but Morgan is getting set up, so we should be right to go momentarily. You'll have to switch me to my... Um, Maybe maybe that thing at the top right will go away. Okay. Um, okay, I'm Morgan. Hi. Um, you can tweet at me if you have questions. Um, I'll see them at the end. Um, let's see. All right, so some facts about um, where I work. I work at the Met. Um, we are 142 years old. Uh, we have about two million square feet of space. Uh, we have 10,000 works of art um, that are on view at any given time. Um, the actual number in our collection is currently being reforecast. Uh, publicly, we still say over two million, um, although it's probably less than that. Uh, we have 6.2 million, uh, 2.8 million visitors uh, to the physical museum last fiscal year, um, and another 44 million website visits. Uh, and about 1,800 people work at the museum in total, and 
it's really actually 58, I found out, in digital media. Um, there's eight people that work in the web group with me, and that's just front end. It doesn't include developers. Um, so I'm the project manager. Uh, that means I deal with day-to-day um, -day kind of operations, tasks, bugs, that stuff, but also any major project that is not a content-driven project. So uh, anything that deals with new functionality, new technology, um, architecture, uh, particularly usability issues um, within the website. Uh, so this is what my desks look like. It's my red folder um, structure. If uh, when, a fold, when a project is proposed by anyone internal to our group, external to our group, uh, it get, they fill out a proposal, print it out in the yellow folder, and then if it's approved, it graduates into its own red folder. So this, is, uh, this was taken right before I came out to Seattle. So this currently, these are the um, major projects uh, that we have uh, in queue right now. Uh, those include um, the following, which I'll just pop up so you get a sense of <laughs> what we consider to be major projects right now. Um, that's all of them. So this doesn't include any of our regular day-to-day -day work or anything that's strictly just content that doesn't hit on the technologies or functionalities. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, several of these, and I, I thought it would be more interesting since um, the smallest museum talked about a massive project and the middle museum talked about middle projects that um, I show you what we consider to be some of our smaller projects, um, which may be very different to you guys out in the audience. Something that we at the Met think is small um, might be a, a big deal to you guys, so I, I'd love to talk about that more afterwards. Um, the first one's uh, foreign languages. So, uh, get my slide. This was something that was initiated by our director. Um, he's very interested in how um, our international presence is um, out there in the world uh, and uh, wanted to make sure that it's visible, that we are catering to an international visitor. It's a, a huge growing population of our physical visitors, and we need to be representing that well on the website. Um, and so it was just a, a, a really a research um, project uh, to figure out what other museums were doing. And I think a, a lot of times in day to day, we get home from these um, conferences and, and we're so inspired, but we're not actually looking at other museums. When we get back, we go back to operating this insular world and it's really important to remember other people have done this stuff first and are doing it. So I tried to incorporate that into this project. So. This is just a screenshot of um, the uh, actual product that I came up with, and I have it available if anyone wants the actual report that I put together, but um, I basically created an internal report uh, for our department head um, that I reviewed 20 different major museums. Um, 12 of them had uh, full um, languages, whether it's one language, whether it's 10 languages, but dealt with an, a language other than American English in some way. Eight of them addressed, did not address language at all, um, and used screenshots and a sentence or two for each. So this is showing you Indianapolis, um, am &H, and British Museum, which were arranged. Um, I thought Indianapolis Museum was really interesting in that they don't have foreign languages, but they have a video for um, American Sign Language on how to use the website, which I thought was um, really great. Um, and the spoiler alert, I, I think Corning Museum of Glass addresses this in the best way of any museum that I've seen, so you should check them out if you're interested. Um, I also looked internally, so um, things like uh, uh, using analytics, um, our browser data, what languages people have their browsers set at, um, where, it, where in the world is, was a little difficult because we have a lot of tourists. So we may have people from Brazil who are sitting in their hotel room in New York and they show up as New York. So it was kind of a fuzzy number. We also looked at analytics straight to those pages that we had um, that are listed, uh, I didn't point it out, in this past slide along the top. The only way you could, could get to it previously was by going to the visit landing page and you can see along the top there, there's um, the list of languages. We didn't list them out anywhere else. And we know from analytics that a lot of people were skipping this landing page and going straight into the hours and information or straight into the plan your visit. And so they wouldn't have even seen that we had these languages to begin with. So 
what we came up with, it was hard to get a screenshot because of Hurricane Sandy. Or, um, <laughs> so usually that red special announcement box wouldn't be there. Um, but what we ended up doing was surfacing the languages to the homepage. So um, usually that would be pushed up. And it used to be that the hours and admission costs were front and center, first thing you saw above the fold. Uh, and now, um, as of two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, we surface all the languages to the homepage. And hopefully that's just going to be our um, just a first phase. Um, we're looking into things like Google Analytics, Google, like Google Translate for um, more areas of the site, uh, and really getting it, our site to be more accessible to uh, visitors of other languages. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, it, since that was just insular to my group, this is one where we worked with another department in the museum, um, uh, the education department. They're sprawling. Um, they have a history of naming things on the website based on their departmental structure, as I'm sure a lot of museums have issues with. And that doesn't make sense to the visitor. And when you're, especially when you're trying to have people come to your events, you want them to be able to find them and understand where to go to find them. And so they had actually come to me saying, we want a new section under events. We want it to be called courses, but we don't know if it should be courses or classes. <laughs> and, and they were concerned because there was courses that were you know, a, a, um, a, a multi-day commitment. And they felt that was different than just a one-off class. And they wanted people to understand that. And so what I instead proposed was running a card sort. Did, has, are people here familiar with that at all? OK. So um, it's a form of user research. There are, are tools online. You can do it for free, um, which is really great. You don't even need people to come in. They can sit at their own computers. And uh, you have a list of terms that you, you want to know how people deal with. So. We used all of the programs that you can see up here. And they get put onto a card. And you ask people to sort them into groups that make sense to them, and then name those groups. And then you start to look for, all right, uh, these people group these three things together. They may have called it something different. Or everyone kind of used this naming convention. And you can start to make inferences about how people are using your data. So we, um, we ended up get we put up, a, there's another tool called Ethneo, which is also awesome um, for getting uh, user research recruits. And we had 508 people respond that they would be willing to help and ended up using 15 participants. Um, we left the card sort up online for a week. And uh, this is an example of one of the things that came out of that study. Again, if someone wants the full study, I have it available. Um, just ask me. Um, but you can start to do really neat things with the data. So we found that. Most people only sorted everything into three groups, and we have like 20 on the website. Um, there, it, people didn't care about category names. They cared if they could do something, like are, are they being talked at, or are they actually making something with their hands? And they cared about whether it was just a lecture, or is this an expert? Is this an art historian? Is someone knowledgeable talking to me or leading me? And, and those were really where we saw the pattern. So you can see that third line, studio art classes, 81% of people, like overwhelmingly, everyone agreed that this was something that belongs in, in a hands-on category. They may not have said hands-on. They may have said art making or something to that effect. But everyone kind of agreed. Some, you know, They said, you as the artist or create. But they, but they were using that kind of terminology. So it was really interesting to be able to go back to the education department and say, all you cared <laughs> about was courses versus classes. But people don't care. And so we're making all these assumptions about how we are structuring our website for people when it, we're just overwhelming them. And so this was the structure that I had proposed based on that. Um, in a, in a very ideal world, we would have only two categories for them. That obviously, you know, change is not overnight. Um, and what we ended up with was this, which um, we changed, uh, we simplified it a little bit. Their, their subcategories are still a little sprawling. Um, but we changed it to be, instead of courses, workshops, studio, all of those to be top level, we made something called art making programs. And that came out of that one simple question. And now we know that people are going to that section more easily and finding it more easily. And we have actually a phase two running right now to look at family programs and see if people are looking by age group or by type. 
Um, so it's nice that now the education department can come back to us and we're working very closely where it used to just be like, ugh, they want another section, fine, ugh, okay. <laughs> and it's really become more of a collaborative effort. This is, to give you an idea of what the family programs page looks like right now, I couldn't fit the screenshots. This is as close as you're gonna get, but it's, it's a lot. And not everything is just families um, because there are things that are for everyone and then the family things occur other places. So there's that. Uh, the last uh, project I want to talk to you about is one that then we had multiple departments involved within the museum, but also we used an outside vendor. Uh, so it's a, a little bigger than the other ones um, in terms of scale, but still a relatively small project for us. <coughs> this is our old website, pre-relaunch last year. Uh, it was a section uh, that used to be called My Met Gallery. And uh, you could save your artworks, you couldn't really do anything past that. You couldn't group them. You couldn't share them. It was just, all right, these are, it was like bookmarking, basically. And when we relaunched the website, this is a new um, shot of it. And uh, you can see it's just prettier <laughs> to begin with. This is my, actually my, my mat, um, some of my favorite things. We give recommendations. We allow people to put them in sets. We allow people to tag them. We allow people to share them, um, share their sets. So it's much more dynamic. You could save events, um, do email things. There's a whole section just for members. And so we wanted a way to promote this and let people know that we have this great new section of the site that you can really use and, and, and do what you want with. And so at the time, our <coughs> video production team was pretty slammed as they always are with internal projects. And I went to them with this idea, I want to do an, an instructional video, but not a boring one. I want it to be fun. Like I want it to be, you know, animated and cool. And they were like, great, like next five years from now. <laughs> um, and they, I got their blessing to look for an outside vendor. Um, and I'm gonna give you a key into our schedule. So in 2011, September, it's when we launched the website. It didn't have the full capabilities of MyMet that we wanted. We were rolling those out slowly. So in November, we rolled out the My Event section, followed by, um, in January, the tagging. And that was really when we felt it was pretty complete as a section. Uh, and then you go to July, skip back up. That's when we had originally approached the vendor. Um, and then October, we were starting to storyboard something that wasn't complete. And so it was really difficult to be working with an outside vendor, figuring out um, what kind of things should go into this video when we didn't know what was going to be delivered when. Um, you know, it's, a, it's hard enough dealing with those kind of problems internally when you have an outside person coming and helping you. It's e doubly frustrating. Um, they delivered the video in December of 2011. We still hadn't finished rolling out these products. Um, and we finally rolled out the video in February. So in terms of who else was involved, one of Suze's big questions, uh, we had the um, video media production managers, that's where it started. Um, and then we had to go to the council's office, which if any of you have to deal with lawyers, mm -hmm. God bless you. Um, we actually made the mistake of telling them it was a video project and had instead of just like a multimedia, like if we had phrased it any other way, I think it would have been so smooth. Um, but they hear the word video and they think filming. And even though we were doing no filming in the galleries, it ended up a 20-page contract for a very simple multimedia video project um, because there's just so many other issues that go into filming. Um, they uh, write some reproductions. Um, we're using artworks in a video, so we had to be allowed to use them. There's um, a little section of the site that of the video that shows you can collect my purple paintings. And one of the purple paintings they proposed, that was a lot of peas, um, what we would have gotten slammed if the wrong person saw it. So dealing with rights and reproductions office um, and uh, subcontractors for some of the um, cooler animations that we had, our vendor had to deal with subcontracting. We needed sound sourcing. You know, there's a doorbell sound that we had to go find the person who recorded the doorbell sound, like things you never think about. Um, 
And we worked with a great band out of San Francisco called Gaucho who donated, they do like really great gypsy jazz, like donated the music for the video. Um, and Pippin, my dog, was a contributor. Uh, and we were doing storyboarding and we see this pug. It's like, you even named your pug Horus because you love Egypt so much. And I was like, do we have rights to that pug photo? And they're like, oh no, we'll find them. And I was like, well, I have a dog. <laughs> So my dog is in the MyMed video. Um, and then once it's all done, you have this weird kind of thing of promoting a promotional piece because you're so proud of this end product and still a lot of peas. And um, <laughs> you're, you're proud of this product and you want people to see it and get it out there, but it's, it's a promotional piece. So we... Um, when, when you get to the site, that's actually our, our header at the top, and at the very top right is the MyMet button, and you click on it, and the whole thing comes down. And so on the left, where we used to say, like, what is my Met? Share your artwork, blah, 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 like in a text format. Now you see the video. Um, and we sent out emails, you know, reminding people, there's my Met, and the video's front and center. And so we really got to showcase this thing that we'd been working on for four months that we were really proud of and I want to show it to you as an end product if I can figure out Rob can oh. figure out how to get over to that for me and then hope this speaker point the mic yeah actually this is just for the video anyway oh. so so, we just have to be quiet. All right, so we can see. hopefully it works then. Hopefully. Okay, so <laughs> now's a good time for people to be thinking about the questions they want to ask <laughs> while we get to the video stage. Um, some of the things that I think are really interesting that are coming up out of these discussions is how you work with different sorts of stakeholders and who gets involved with these, like how collaborative these things are. Um, I, I think personally there's a lot to, to be in there and one of the things I want to ask Rob about when you've seen this video is what happens if Rob if something happens to Rob in terms of, you know, he seems to have a whole lot of institutional knowledge that maybe I, I'm really interested as to how that translates elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, I try to document a lot mm. and I try to have lots of opportunistic brief on the fly conversations with my two colleagues about, by the way, mm. um, don't let me be the only one who knows this, let me tell you something. Um, and some, uh, clear, clearly that's, in one sense, not as stable on the face of it as documentation. But there also is a lot of institutional knowledge that, how to put it, is hard to fit into a typology for documentation. It would be, if you documented it all, it would be, that would be like sort of like free text yeah. random notes or something. Yeah, okay. And, you know, I'm sure all places have various little snippets of things that get handed along in written form. But So, yeah, there's just a lot of sort of ad hoc information sharing in that sense too. I mean, and that's, that's enabled in some ways because we are so small. I mean, with only three of us there, uh, in a way that would probably seem highly unusual and probably would only happen in far more formalized settings in a larger space, um, it's quite common for the entire museum staff to sit down at the table together. Yeah, you can have coffee so, and tell yeah. people what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 so, no. so in, in- We can't even get yeah. our group so in, so in that sense, there's, there's more um, sort of institutional, social, operational kind of affordance for that kind of point to point. By the way, you need to know this. Yeah, so, so I'm not the only one who does. Institutional so. knowledge can almost be social knowledge rather than. I think in, in some ways it can be there. Yeah. Um, and it, as, a, as a fundamental model, that would be highly dangerous. Mm -hmm. But as a practical tactic, it works pretty well some of the time. Okay. So. Are you having any work for the video now? No, but I just realized I'm just going to pull it up in my Dropbox. Oh, okay. good. So Do you guys want to want Morgan's getting the video ready? Does someone have a question? Don't forget, you've got a tatly. Question. So when, when your current version of the Walters website designed in house, or was that outside? So uh, I'm the the it question first. is, uh, did we design the current version of our collections website in-house? Uh, 
It was a it was a partnership effort. We we found a developer that we could work with, uh, having been somewhat displeased with the previous developer that we had worked with. Uh, that first version that you saw was done in house, uh, but after that, we've usually had a web development firm that we can work with. Um, because it is very difficult to build a website that has 10,000 pages on it if you're one person. Uh, it might not even be possible without some help. So um, we, we work with a, a firm in Baltimore called FastBot, and uh, we're, we're, we're happy with, with the partnership there. Do you guys? Cause I, I'd love, there's a question that this is bringing up for me, but I, I don't want to take away your time. I, I think it's, I'm interested as to when you choose to go outside like obviously part of it is mm. purely a size thing mm -hmm. but you would obviously use external partners as well and that might not be a size mm. thing necessarily so what what drives that decision making um, for us uh, a lot of the times um, things that uh, we do day to day are just day to day so uh, we have um, projects that there aren't necessarily budget lines for. It's just stuff we do that other people would consider, all right, well, that's going to be this much money and that's going to be this much money. And, and so when there's something to be done that we don't um, have resources to do or have time to do, it just doesn't get done because we don't have a budget line for things like this. The video, we were lucky in that we had budget from the relaunch project. Um, and part of that budget was held for promotional pieces, and this was considered promoting um, the new site. So otherwise, this video wouldn't have happened. And the other stuff that we do, um, you know, I, I put in a budget line when we did budgets, you know, now 18 months ago for um, user research and incentives for getting people in. So I was able to do the education um, work that I did. Otherwise, you know, we rely on the kindness of strangers to <laughs> help us with user research. Um, but if I hadn't had that budget, it just wouldn't have been there. So a lot of times it, it does for us still come down to money like, like everybody else um, and what we have resources for and, and the relative importance. All right. Speaking of the video, now you can well, show us. Hopefully. Have try. Fun. Hopefully. Hey. Except you guys can't hear it, but... The Metropolitan Museum of Art is one of the largest and most respected art institutions in the world. The Met currently has 17 curatorial departments, 5,000 years of art, 2 million objects in its collection, and consists of over 2 square miles of public space. Think you can see it all in one day? Good luck with that. <laughs> so to help, we've created a service that helps you organize the Met into something a bit more manageable. It's called MyMet, a free service with an ever-expanding features list that will help you collect and connect with the Met, its collections, its curators, staff, and of course, your friends. Say you're absolutely obsessed with all things Egypt. You named your poodle for us and you tattooed an egg onto your right bicep. Thinking you might satisfy your Egypt fix at the Met over a long lunch break, you go to the museum website and search for Egypt. Check out all this Egyptian stuff. And there's even an itinerary. <coughs> With the itinerary That's not on our website. To my bet, you're ready to check out the museum. As you wander along and check out the local celebrities, an artwork off the beaten path catches your eye. It's William the Hippo. Later, you spot William on your saved itinerary and add him to my map so you don't forget about him. And you grab a few other interesting artworks you missed on your itinerary to be sure not to miss them on your next visit. My map makes it easy to find and keep your favorite map moments before and after each visit. And did you know there's always something cool happening at the Met? With my Met Reminders, you won't miss critical skill-building seminars or even access to recipes from our members-only dining room. You can even use my Met to create and share photo sets to make classwork a bit more organized or share your unique taste for art with your friends and family. Introducing my Met, a place to collect and connect. It's 100% free and takes just seconds to join, so sign up now. So that had some of the examples of the difficulties of trying to make a piece when your product isn't finished because we actually do get visitor emails being like, I watched this video, I'm not seeing that add to itinerary button, is there something wrong with my computer? And it's like, 
Well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that we had planned to do and then we saw the analytics of how people were saving events versus artworks and it was really artwork heavy and people weren't saving events and it's just hard to make a good make your own itinerary tool and it kept falling down the list falling down the list and we weren't going to not launch the video because we didn't have the one little button done and so it's done and some people notice and some people don't and some of the people who notice just think oh that would be nice it's representative and some people are very literal and email you and ask you what's wrong <laughs> but um, it was just another kind of layer of pushing things out because we're on a deadline with a vendor so what do you guys think I mean in terms of looking at these ideas of from proposal to payoff what are the things that is resonating with, with these discussions here yeah, I'm just yeah. curious do you find yourselves, and this is for each of you, uh, getting a pool of money and then you're in charge of prioritizing projects? Mm -hmm. Or are you creating the demand for What is this? What is this pool of money? Coordinates, please. We yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to dive right in. No. I, the answer is no. Yeah. I mean, we... I mean, it could be a grant. It, it, if, there's a project, yeah. if there's a project, if there's a project, that specifically doesn't fall under the day-to-day -day kind of workings. Um, it either waits until it gets scheduled into a fiscal year budget or we go out and look for grant money. Um, but there's not really a discretionary fund or anything of that matter for kind of a sandbox in general. There, you know, we have a, a sandbox group in, in the web, in the web, not the web team. It's not the web team is the point. Right. It's in digital media and they, you know their budget is different from our budget and so they they have more of a sense of play money um, but we don't we're very operationally driven so anything that we do we have money for or the education department goes and gets a grant or the development department gets a donor but we don't um, we just all of our budget is just day-to-day -day or what a proposed project brings in with it I should rephrase I'm thinking more of the specifics within the projects I guess so picking an a doing an API versus more money on the design like do you have the, the autonomy mm -hmm. once you get the budget to, to do with it whatever you want or is it detailed out it, it can depend on uh, whether the money is sourced from a grant or internal <laughs> funds um, like the Met we uh, have that sort of fiscal year process where uh, we decide how to allocate the year's money for various projects. And if that comes internally, it can be a little more flexible. With web technologies, you know, if you said two years ago, well, I want, I want this application, uh, two years later the money rolls around and that application is obsolete or there's a better one, we're flexible there. But sometimes in a grant you say, we want money from the government to buy specifically this thing. Mm -hmm. You buy specifically that thing. But is it you that triages? Because I'm going to use your mm -hmm. word. Is it you, who is it that triages which are important and un, and less important right. projects mm -hmm. within the Because you're kind of the stakeholder, yeah. the driver, and the project manager is with mm. you. Mm. Yeah. Or, or at least one one among yeah. stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. I would say. Pick but, two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think that's something of a collective decision uh, at the Walters. That's something that's that's really sort of at the level of the directors, but. There's pretty good open channels of communication, so you could say, hey, this thing we plan to buy uh, isn't the right one. We need this one instead, that, that sort of thing. Um, but that, that's really at the director's level that decisions of that type are made. So we'd have to you know, call a meeting or write a, write a thing. Yeah. Yeah, and that, my answer would be a sort of an odd hypothetical yes, which is to say, if we did have dedicated technology budget within our modest little operating budget, uh, that would, in theory, uh, be fungible across projects and shifting priorities and would basically be up to us to allocate uh, within that pool. That said, uh, in a way writ small, we are one among many poster children for the difficulty in many cases in getting any sort of ongoing programmatic uh, funding for technology built into museum operational budgets. Um, for, for us, it tends to be zero sum with um, completely unrelated non-technology projects, which in a philosophical way could be a good thing, because uh, since we do operate on a basic shoestring, um, the ability for non-technology projects that happen at a given time to be more important than anything 
technological that would require substantial funds. Um, that is how that should play out. Uh, but it doesn't make it easy to um, plan towards undertaking any particular projects that have technology, non-trivial technology expenses associated with them uh, unless we have some sense of how we can find some sort of special one-time extraordinary something that will actually enable us to cross some threshold to making it real. Um, and for us, I mean, on, on the scale in that uh, when there's money available for a project, I, I as project manager w might go through and look at several different solutions, pick which one I like the most, but all of them get presented to you know the department head or the director, um, whoever really signs off on the purse strings. So e even though I may make a recommendation, it's not necessarily the one that we may go with and the recommendation doesn't necessarily always tie directly to cost. It can never go over cost. Um, there's not a situation where you can say, well, this is really the best thing, but we only allocated this much. Um, and interestingly enough, our website relaunch project, which was a two and a half year project uh, that launched last September, was came out of capital funds. Um, it was considered a capital project along the same veins as a physical building project. Um, and so it routed through those same funds and those uh, same kind of set of rules. So. Uh, it, in some ways it was a lot stricter, but in some ways it was um, almost easier because there, we weren't tying things to specific technologies in a proposal um, or, or even specific, like we need search. It wasn't like um, anything more specific than that and that was just a line item uh, in a capital budget. So um, we were lucky in that respect that we did have a lot more control over where things kind of shifted within a budget. But. Yeah, and I, I can add to that in our, uh, as a sort of a smaller mirror to that in a way, that when we do on occasion secure uh, project specific funding for something uh, that is fundamentally technological, we're careful to craft requests and communications about that respective project in a way that doesn't tie us to any specific equipment or technology or software packages because a, because it's not fundamentally about that, it's about accomplishing something that's going to serve mission, and B, the landscape of the best tools for that is, of course, continually evolving. Um, so rather than provide people with what could be kind of a red herring of, oh, they want to use this, and we're going to fund it so they can use it to do this thing, it's they want to do this thing, and that's important, so we'll fund it, and then that preserve space for us to navigate in whatever seems like the most intelligent way down the road as we're actually spending money. Okay, and I saw, so, did you have a question? It was sort of the same question, which was who gets to decide what's the process? Um, is it top down, is it horizontal? Do you have the autonomy as a project director? For some of it, I do. Um, you know, the uh, the foreign language thing, I, I, I presented the findings since that's something the director was very um, uh, involved in. Um, you know, he we made recommendations um, and he approved them, but, uh, and I worked with the content editor, uh, our, our content editor for the website to figure out kind of the best way based on all of that. The um, education department stuff was completely autonomous. Um, I told my department head that I was working with them on it just because we would be using funds um, to support their their projects. Um, but otherwise, there was no kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say there was no check-in or oversight because you know they knew what we were doing, but um, I could make recommendations based on the data without having to check them through anything. Um, and we could make changes uh, that we agreed upon without anyone else um, looking at it. The video, um, I worked on it pretty much on my own with the vendor once we got through all the contracts, um, aside from the things like getting the, making sure the rights were okay. Um, it, was, uh, it was really nice actually um, to be able to work like that. I wasn't expecting it on a project like that because of the visibility of it, um, being allowed to, uh, someone telling me that I could use my own judgment was really nice um, to know whether 
that language might not be the right language. You know, we struggled with that. Like, think you have time for that? Good luck with that. Like, is a line in the video, and it's like, is good luck with that? Is that really? Is that pushing the edge too much for the Met? You know, like, <laughs> and try, really trying to like put a little bit of quirkiness <clears throat> into it. Um, where I think if we had had the oversight that um, is typical on a lot of um, front-facing projects, it would not have looked anything like what you saw up there. Um, so I, I think it really depends on who's interested to begin with, and then th then we decide who gets to <laughs> just put stuff out there. Yeah, and, and, and thinking about that a bit more, uh, Ray, my earlier response, there are some projects where um, more details of specific tools to be used definitely do have to get pinned down in order for us to get traction for funding. And those would tend to be actually the, the case example that I talked about initially, uh, the collection system. Since that was not just a one-time lump of money to do something and execute and then be done and have some outcomes, um, it also carried this ongoing annual cost. and. Um, not quite so direct, but but clearly perceptible uh, ongoing overhead costs for VMs running in a data center and all this. Uh, there was a lot more to pin down in advance of uh, budgetary approval because this was not our budget uh, before we took that specific path uh, with all aspects or all foreseeable aspects of software and uh, virtual machines and everything pinned down very concretely because I think largely because there was going to be an ongoing need for um, data center support for certain aspects of things back on the server end. Um, and they wanted to be eyes wide open about just exactly what it was that uh, we were asking for in that regard. Yeah. Um, at your various scales, uh, do you have um, published or, or internally published content or technology strategies? And then how do you map your projects to those, sort of going back to the governance? Um, we have uh, a vision statement that we put together um, at the beginning of the website relaunch project, which is now you know, three years old. Um, but a lot of it still applies. I was actually looking at it for a different project a couple weeks ago. Um, we don't specifically match to it, um, but if a project comes across um, that has been proposed that we know doesn't fit it or isn't in the spirit of it, we'll come back to the proposing department and um, ask for further clarification or work with them to try and get it to be something that really fits within what our vision is for the website. Um, we approve more than we can take on, definitely, um, at, because that is one of the um, base criteria for approving a project. Is it fulfilling um, the mission of the website? Um, as opposed to just the mission of the institution. Um, but we do reject projects, too, based on that. So we, we use it, but not to the letter. We don't. Uh, we don't have a, a written strategy. And I wonder, if we did have one, it sure would be nice to have an editor hold the content against the strategy and then revise it accordingly. But we don't have that either. Um, uh, so what we have instead, and this is this is nicely flexible and it it works for us fairly well, is we have a work group, uh, and so all of the all of the key players in the in the creation of content, uh, many of them are managers in the education department. Uh, or the visitor services people, uh, the people who in particular are describing events, uh, meet somewhat regularly and email pretty much constantly around uh, the, the timing of emails that go out to the public, which things go on Twitter, oh my gosh, this event's tomorrow and no one's signed up for it, we need to reprioritize it. Um, and we're a pretty tight-knit group for that sort of thing. Um, I work with that group to make sure that uh, if we adopt a new content tool, uh, either for something like Twitter or for making um, uh, commercial emails, uh, that they're trained up on it. When that, when that deadline I mentioned earlier is coming, do we all remember our training? Does anyone need a refresher? Yes, every time. Um, so, 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 but then, uh, because there's a work group and I'm a department of one, there's a lot of, oh, well, let me show you. I'm also in the work group. I remember how to do that. 
Uh, don't bug poor Dylan about it. I can show you how that works. Um, so the, the work group functions like a strategy uh, because together we have shared needs and so on. And in our case, we, on the one hand, we don't have a, how to put it, um, standing document that is scoped to include sort of all things digital technology and not other things. Um, so there's no document that says this is our digital strategy up at the top. What we do do is, um, on the one hand, keep uh, relevant pieces of digital work um, visible in general strategic statements um, in, of course, very condensed, collapsed ways. And then as circumstances um, require or, or suggest um, due to opportunities or needs to present something out to somebody at any given time, um, we'll craft um, short statements that are focused on some particular area of digital work. A recent example being um, a couple of months ago, um, there was a useful internal need within uh, uh, our relationship to other uh, folks at Wesleyan to offer them a clear sense of where we see ourselves headed with digital image access in an age of open access and aggregated discovery. And it was really useful to put all of this down, one page PDF, we could send it off to a few people who were interested in this and didn't know much about where we stood. And then that also is a useful kind of incentive for us to crystallize stuff that we knew that we were working on, uh, that we knew why we were working on it, and basically where we envisioned that being headed, but we had not in this constant flux of triage uh, had a reason to sit down and say, you know what, I'm going to write this thing this afternoon and not do this other stuff. So some of it tends to be contextually driven like that. Okay, guys, I'm actually afraid we are out of time. Um, I know that one of our panelists has to duck off pretty quickly to the airport. The other two, I'm hoping, are happy to stand around and actually discuss this a little bit more if you would like to come up and have a chat. Um, as, you know, I think there are some interesting issues that people from different institutions might be able to get like based on the size and things that they might be able to ask from this. So I'm sure that uh, certainly Morgan and Rob will be happy to yeah. stand around and have a chat to you even if Dylan and I And if you it. asked a question, come get your come get a temporary tattoo from Tatley. <laughs> <laughs>